Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 47 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks, Zaki. Uh, good to be back. Uh, we uh, have been pretty good with these episodes, so uh, this one dropping not too, uh, not like, 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 you know, not like our usual sort of breaks in the middle there, but, uh, you know, following right after uh, Azar Rahman's episode, so which was well received so we're really excited about that uh but equally excited if not more with uh the guests that we have today zucky if you don't mind doing the honors yeah so to, well our, our guest uh this month is dr ihsan bagby who is an associate professor in the department of islamic studies at the university of kentucky his research is focused on muslims in america in 2001 he published the results of the first comprehensive study of mosques in america entitled the mosque in america a national portrait Based on the 2001 study, Dr. Bagby has published four articles, Imams and Mosque Organizations in the United States, in Muslims in the United States, a profile of African-American mosques in Journal of the Interdenominational Theological Center, Attitudes of Mosque Participants Towards America in the forthcoming book, A Nation of Religions, The Politics of Pluralism in Multi-Religious America, and The Mosque in the American Public Square in Muslims' Place in the American Public Square. Dr. Bagby received his PhD in Near Eastern Studies from the University of Michigan with a specialty in Islamic law. Dr. Bagby, thank you so much for coming on Diffuse Congruence this beautiful Sunday morning. It's my pleasure. So, uh, you you have mentioned that you converted to Islam in 1969, I think you said. Yes. So, uh, I think as a way to sort of uh, ground the discussion we're about to have, I'm sure Pervez and I and our audience would love to get a sense of what your journey to Islam was like and, and what led to that momentous decision. Well, you know, being African American and growing up in the 60s, the dominant issue was civil rights and the struggle for black people for their freedom and for their dignity, and I became involved in that. Um, I'm a child of that era, and therefore a child of Malcolm X. Hmm. Uh, reading the autobiography of Malcolm X was a key event. I remember, you know, purchasing it and going to my dorm room. I was in undergraduate uh, uh, college and uh, opened it up uh, around 6 p.m. and couldn't put it down. I read it all night, and then after finishing it, by the morning, I dreamed of him. So uh, Malcolm had a profound experience uh, on me, and it opened up the possibility of Islam, and um, coinciding with that interest was my own spiritual journey. And so, you know, Islam for me represented two things, uh, both a, a deep personal spiritual way of life, but also a vehicle for becoming involved in the struggle for justice in society. So the social justice message of Islam really rung true for me, and the biography of the, the struggle of Muhammad wasallam also rung true and um I, I said, this is for me, because it combines both of my very deep interests. And um, so I uh, joined the local mosque and the black community I grew up in and uh, have, you know, progressed ever since, growing both in my spirituality and in my um, Islam. Uh, so I think you also mentioned, um, you know, Prior to uh, right off mic when we were when we when we talked earlier, you grew up in uh, in Cleveland. Is that is that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So yeah. so uh, maybe also tell us a little bit about kind of um, I guess growing up in Cleveland, what Cleveland was like, and I guess in the fifties and sixties in terms of kind of some of the kind of obviously some of the racial tensions that you've already sort of identified, um, and then also if you could perhaps kind of maybe a, a peek into kind of the religious sensibilities that you kind of grew up in vis-a-vis -vis your parents and, and kind of their, you know, religious background? And, 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 and was there always sort of a, you know, uh, kind of, an, uh, I guess, an inertia to kind of, you know, maybe have you looking 
looking for uh, looking for other solutions or or, quite, or answers to some of the some of the you know obviously the, the the larger questions that came up in your life. Right. Well, kind of deep background. I am biracial. My father is black. My mother is white. And I ended up in Cleveland because in the late 1940s, a black and white couple could not marry in Indiana. In fact, it will be late 60s before Indiana changes its law to allow uh, biracial marriages. So my mother and father had to leave Indiana, and my mother's folks prop promptly disowned her Mm -hmm. um and so i grew up in the black community not even knowing my white relatives um and and that was america in uh the 50s and the late 40s and my father kept a list of uh, that we all knew of places that we would never shop in because when he moved to Cleveland in the late 40s. Um, there were places that still did not uh, serve black people at their lunch counters. So uh, <laughs> I, I still, in my mind, know that list of places that I will never put my foot in. <laughs> and so America uh, was still very racist. You know, America really does not start dealing with racism uh, until the 60s. Many people miss that, that um, the changes in attitudes are very recent, relatively. Um, and so when I grew up, coming of age, everybody knew. In fact, I can remember so many times the principal getting on the in a calm at the beginning of school day and saying, you know, this is a new era, we're depending on you. It went over our heads. What, <laughs> what is he talking about? But there was a sense that things are changing and we have to be part of that change. Of, of course, um, a, a lot of things, you know, negative to a certain extent, but um, I live through, there were four riots in Cleveland. I lived through two. I, uh, actually, the very first one, I was coming from junior high, and I just happened onto it, you know, came to a, the intersection of a street, and everybody was throwing rocks at at cars. So, um, And in the other riot in 68, the um, National Guard put their uh, vehicles in front of our house, you know, that was a rallying point for the National Guard vehicle. So um, it was a very uh, tumultuous time, actually. Um, right. And people were looking for answers. I grew up as a Methodist, but by high school I had turned away from Christianity as, as being um, uh, uninvolved in the struggle and being composed of people who did not seem very serious about uh, religion, spirituality, morality. So again, I'm looking for two things, something that has some real spirituality associated with it, um, and also a, a, um, a call for engagement, and I did not think the Christian Church um, really promoted those two things. And so I turned away from Christianity, thinking I turned away from God, because most Americans don't think there's too many alternatives to Christianity, and um, our society was not a very diverse society at that time, Cleveland in the 19, early 1960s, as I'm growing up. Hmm. Uh, but in college, I decided to look at religions, and typical of most Americans, you kind of look at Islam last, and so I did look at Buddhism and Hinduism and so many other kind of uh, metaphysical ways of thinking, and uh, when I finally came upon Islam, um, I I just loved it, and soon after, um, through a process though, um, I became Muslim, and I have committed myself to that way of life ever since. Well, and can you connect the dots from 
uh, embracing the religion to becoming a scholar in in this area because i mean uh that that itself is I- an elevation of certainly your commitment mhm well um another thing may- many people don't realize is that you have uh three streams of the islamic experience in america you have an African American stream, and that African American stream is actually divided up into two: one, the Nation of Islam, and the other, what I call historically Sunni African American Muslims. And then the Nation of Islam evolves into the Association of Imam Muhammadin Muhammad, may Allah bless his soul, um, and uh, also the Sunni Muslims. So. There have been parallel histories of those two African American Muslim groups, and then on the other hand, you have the immigrant group. So I grew up in a, a, a historically Sunni African American Muslim mosque and organization called Dar es Salaam, and my path to scholarship is basically coming for one I have to back up and say that you know I became a conscientious objector I refused hmm. to go to the Vietnam war based on my islam I, Muhammad Ali got did not get his um um ability to opt out uh as a conscientious objector because of islam but I did I don't know how I did it but <laughs> they wow. gave me an exemption and so uh, uh, to be, when you're a conscientious objector, you have to move away for, from your home for two years and work in some job that nobody wants. So anyway, I moved to Atlanta, well, and it was I, a very I didn't know that, actually. That's, that's really interesting. I didn't know that that was an uh-huh. aspect of being an objector. Wow. Yeah, yeah. No, there's no free pass. You have to leave your home for two years, and... Um, this is 1971, and um, so I went to Atlanta, and just for a two a situation, a group had just formed to start a mosque. So, in fact, I went there and started um, being active in this local mosque, the first mosque in Atlanta, at least, you know, mainstream Islam, they had a Nation of Islam mosque, but um, uh, they were not really Muslims and not practicing what we think of as Islam. So we started the first mosque, but it attracted a lot of uh, people from overseas. And that was my first experience with people from overseas. Mm -hmm. And I I grew up in the black community. My mosque were were all African Americans. I had no experience with immigrants. So I went to Atlanta it was my first experience with immigrant Muslims, our dear brothers and sisters from overseas. But what happened is they would come into the masjid and say, y'all should be doing this. You need to do this. This is not right. Y'all should be doing this. And it would frustrate me to no end because I didn't have any way to judge what's good advice, what's not advice, what's required, and that's what, what's not required. So after some time, I said to myself, i got to learn this faith, you know, so I'm not jerked around and my people are not jerked around, you know, uh, just because somebody comes in and, and new and tells us, you know, this is the way to do it. So I decided I need to learn some of uh, this religion, and I tried to go overseas, but I had a wife in uh, Medina, did uh did not then i don't think even now they um allow wives to come you can finagle it but it's you know so i said no i really don't want to leave my wife and so i decided to go to michigan to study arabic and i just loved it so much i just kept on going i just never stopped (laughs) never stopped spent some years in egypt studying um but you know that's how i chose the path of learning, but really it was my passion which was kindled through the learning of Islam. It was just so much fun. It was just so exciting 
to learn things uh, about this great faith that I just kept going and still going on. So, I mean, when when you look at, you know, certainly with, with the benefit of your years of perspective, when you look at um, the evolution of how Islam is perceived in the West, do you see an arc that is cause for optimism or cause for concern? Well, it's optimism, mm-hmm. um, but the reality is that in the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, we are not on anybody's radar screen. Sure. Uh, and certain sociologists have talked about kind of the um, stages that minority new immigrant groups go through. So one stage is invisibility, you know, where you're not on anybody's mind. And that's really where we were um, in the 70s, even into the 80s. Um, And then there's a period of recognition where, yes, there is a community here. And... I think, you know, that is um, in the 80s, into the 90s, and in the 90s, we really, the Muslim community really starts um, outreach efforts. That's when impact, care, uh, before them there was the American Muslim Council, which is now defunct, which was the hmm. first organization kind of aimed at civil rights and, and outreach. And, uh, you know, you could go down the list of all the groups that, and they all formed in the 90s. You know, the American Muslim community realized that we need to get involved in society. Um, we, we, we need to fashion this image and also our own self-understanding that we are American Muslims. You know, and that hmm. we deserve a seat at the table. So that's when we really started kind of demanding a seat at the table to be recognized as uh, a, a, another strand in the fabric of America. And so that's what the, the stage that is typically called a stage of negotiation. Hmm. When, yes, there is this new phenomena, but. There is no seat for them, and there's this fairly contentious uh, conversation. And and basically, we're still in that. It it began in the very small terms in the 90s, but of course, 9-11 put us out front, and the spotlight has been on us ever since. But clearly, it is still a... um, issue of do we belong and the arc has been greater acceptance of us and now we see a recent backlash not only to us but other minority groups hispanics african americans that you know we really don't belong we are not part of the society in fact we are a problem, we're a danger, and that's always been the narrative of some people, you know, against uh, this new group, a new religion, in fact, uh, this Islam thing. So um, we're now in in a very uh, bad period of this um, negative reaction, Uh, but I think overall... Um, it's inevitable th- that uh, we will be accepted. Um, mm. I-, I see no, what can I say, um, the-, the signs are good. We've come a long way sure. since 1980s and the 1990s. And um, whereas in the 1990s, I had arguments in so many masajid about even the term American Muslim. You know, I, I was still convincing people that we are American Muslims, that we have to become yeah. involved. Two little simple things. I remember I was in a southern town, 
uh, teaching in the college, but the big local masjid, um, I, I went to because uh, to collect money because we had started a feeding program in the big a homeless shelter there in town. They had a, the city had a gigantic homeless shelter, and so we Muslims organized a group, and we would go and cook food and serve uh, a meal every once a month at, at this homeless shelter. And I went to the big mosque to raise money, and they said, we, we, we're not going to pay for, give money to pay for winos, and, you know, people don't deserve it. You know, why would you, we do that? We're going to give it to Muslims. So that's the 1990s. And, of course, after 9-11 and into the 2000s, this particular mosque became a champion of supporting efforts like that. So wow. there has been a true sea change in the understanding of Muslims. So that's another reason I'm positive. It's no longer a debate, really, within the Muslim community. Are we American Muslims or not? Are we just Muslims? Forget about the American? No, we... That that has been settled for the most part. I mean, there are always pockets, but it's no longer a debate in mosque and among Muslims whether we're American Muslims. We have embraced it, and um, and and so the future is good for us. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, for me, as a sort of a child or, or a product of the '90s, I should say, in terms of my own sort of coming of age uh, with regards to my own Muslim identity in the '90s, um, you know, just hearing you talk about a lot of those changes um, just brings back. You know a lot of you know a lot of memories, but um, you know some good, some bad. But I, I think a lot of the sort of tensions that you, you've been kind of talking about um, that played out in the '90s. I, I definitely want to come back to that. But if, if I could, um, maybe take us back a little bit um, because I, I think we'd be remiss not to kind of delve into uh, uh, the, the some of the like when you talk about some of the tensions uh, about being American and being Muslim. Um, would you? Would you? Is is that something that you that 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 sort of sort of post 1965 the the influx of the immigrant community coming into the United States? Because how much of that actually existed? You know, uh, in the in the in the 50s and 60s, for example in the days of the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X, kind of things you were earlier you were you were talking about earlier. Right. Well, among African American Muslims. Historically, from the 1920s yes. up until really the 80s or the 90s, the narrative of Islam for African Americans was that Islam was a vehicle for stepping outside of America, a, a, a place where your identity and your values could be placed that were in a box that could was not labeled America. So, um, you know, Malcolm famously said something, you know, I, I, I'm not American, uh, don't call me American, I didn't land at Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on me. And that was true of all of African-American Muslims, whether historically Sunni or not, it was very anti-American. And, and that was me, too. Don't call me American. I did not stand up for the Star Spangled Banner. When I, I went to basketball games, I would not stand up. Um, football, I would not stand up. So um, that was the position. In fact, we, in the 60s into the 70s, we looked down on immigrant Muslims that seemed to be very intent on becoming American and being a part of America. All of that started to change in the 80s. For me personally, it started to change in the 70s when I lived overseas and I realized I am American. <laughs> you, yeah, you go that's overseas, right. <laughs> you, the, you realize that there are certain <laughs> values, the way you look at things, oh, yeah. that really define you as an American. There's nothing wrong with other peoples, but you're just who you are, and who you are has been shaped by the American experience. 
So in the late 70s, right. I came back with a much greater appreciation of that aspect of who I am, you know. And I True. think just through mature, maturing in life, the temperature, the level of animosity, hostility, tension with America started to decline, especially as America became less racist. I mean, I guess you'd have to add that it's not just becoming more mature and more balanced, but also um, racism started to decline uh, much. And I assume if racism had not declined, we might have, might have remained as uh, strident against America as we were as young uh, people. So uh, you, you have to put that in the equation also. But definitely um, the rhetoric and the hostility started to decline, especially in the 80s. And, and, and even in terms of relations with other people, other Muslims, so with immigrants and even with former Nation of Islam people, the temperature started to decline. So I mentioned that all three, kind of the, the old Nation of Islam, then the Imam Muhammad's Association, the historically Sunni and the immigrant communities, kind of lived separate lives. They did not interact. But in the right. 80s, you start interacting. You start see, interacting. And one event that rings um, true to me as an example of that is when Imam Jamil al Amin visited the Isna headquarters. And soon after that, um, um, Elijah Muhammad, this is the son, Elijah Muhammad Jr., the son of Elijah Muhammad and the brother of Imam Walter D. Muhammad also visited the Isna headquarters. But especially Imam Jamil's visit um, was a, a big change uh, in attitudes. Well, it, it represented a big change in attitudes both both ways, Isna mm -hmm, looking at mm -hmm. Sunni African Americans and Sunni African Americans looking at Isna and other immigrants, and right. a, a great willingness to try to have dialogue, and that's what exactly happened. Actually, Ma'am Jamil started becoming, he started having in, in, uh, invitations from Isna and other immigrant communities, and he started having other immigrants, you know, work with him, and and that was the beginning of. Uh, our communities coming together. Now, we are have not realized that, but we are a long, long way from the distance distances that existed between African Americans and immigrants in the 70s and even in the 80s. So um, right. the relationship Do you remember are much better. Mm -hmm. What year is that? Do you, I mean, when you say uh, Imam Jamil al Amin visiting... Is, yeah, he visited ISDA about 86 or 87. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, so that I was really working kind of becomes... at ISDA at that time. Oh, okay, okay. So for you, was, that's I sort of... There. Uh -huh. Uh, I mean, you, you, you kind of def consider that kind of a defining or watershed moment in terms of the history right. of, of, of these relationships between the African-American community and immigrant communities. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, Dr. Babb, and, and, and I really appreciate you kind of talking about the, the, the uh, and, and bringing up the things that you have talked about very candidly. Um, you know, I, I, if I could, though, like for me, like, again, just obviously as a as an as a children, of, as a child of immigrants, um, you know, this is for me, this is like in the history books. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't around to to sort of witness a lot of this. Of course, the 80s and 90s is another thing. Um, but when you, when I hear you talking about you know, the relationship of the communities back in the 60s and 70s. Um, when you say, like, for example, like the, the not, not only the African community at large, but specifically the Muslim, uh, the, the, like the sort of the, the, uh, uh, the uh, African-American Muslim community in particular, per se, just given your experiences being anti-American, um, you know, I, I, I see that in the vein of like Muhammad al Lee, for example, right? I mean, in terms of in terms of protest or um, you know, I, I just feel like the 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 character the characteristically anti-American sentiment that was very much part of the African American experience, 
perhaps given, of course, obviously, America's uh, own racial tensions, it just was was very different than the kind of America, the anti-American strained uh, strain you see coming from the immigrant community in, like, say, the eighties. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I think the immigrant community had a problem with America more so on cultural on a cultural level. Correct. Uh, in in other words, they didn't they felt uncomfortable with their place in America because of the contradiction of many cultural values. Now that, even though that existed among African Americans, that was not the issue. In other words, African Americans mm-hmm. still loved football, baseball, still loved the food. You know, they were American in that sense. There was no uncomfortability with being in America and, and saying, right. here is my past and here is my future. I don't have, I don't envision a future outside of America. It's just mm-hmm. that I don't like <laughs> the policies exactly. of America. It, it, it was a political um, issue as opposed to strictly a cultural issue. Or predominantly. Uh, even. Immigrants, yeah. yeah, predominantly. But uh, I think most immigrants in that early period, in their, their early decades of living in America, wanted to succeed economically, but maybe felt some distance from American society because it was so different for them. I, I think that's, that's right. changed over the time. And of course, their children, like yourself, have no problem with it. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, they feel comfortable in, in being Americans. And um, that was true for African Americans, too. It's just that the the political issues and the kind of anti-racist attitudes um, um kind of trumped any type of uh, disagreement with the cultural issues. That was Mm -hmm. not the issue. The issue was the racism and oppression that existed in this country and the suffering that African Americans suffered for 400 years. That, that Mm -hmm. That was the problem. That's right. That's right. Um, and then also, I think even by the time you, you, for example, convert to Islam, you know, in 1969, you know, I think within the African American community, for you to convert to Islam was not seen uh, by any stretch of the imagination, or perhaps by some, I mean, you know, maybe maybe in a limited sense, but a, 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 an act of cultural apostasy. If you will, right? Because yeah. by then, you know, the, the Islam in the African American community, whether it was through the Nation or the Ahmadiyya movement or some of the other strains that we can maybe get into, but um, Islam had found its place within that community. Overall, that's true. That's true. I mean, uh, to be a Muslim was not being out of step with black consciousness and there you go. the struggle. No question. In fact, in my neighborhood, the hip salutation was salam. That, you know, <laughs> when you were hip, that, that's what you said. So, I mean, and, you know, wearing the more Islamic long dresses and um, men, you know, and women also. I mean, that was in. That was hip. That's but right. it was not necessarily easy. I mean, so when I converted... My father, African-American, was the most resistant to my conversion. And um, and in general, the black church has been very hostile to Islam overall. And so even today, when you look at interfaith, it's all white churches. Black churches do not get involved in interfaith. there's a rivalry and also mm. a conservatism in black Christianity that does not feel comfortable interfacing with Muslims. So my father, I mean, he gave me real trouble, real trouble. Um, you, know, you know, he I, was not terribly religious, but man, all of a sudden he was Jesus, yeah. this, Jesus, that. Um, <laughs> but I must say, I won him over by living up 
to the teachings of Islam, of being good to the parents. And so when he saw me really trying to be uh, nice to him and to help him and to be respectful, he finally said, after about a year, he said, well, if Islam is, means that you're going to change like this, then i got to accept it. So I mm -hmm. won him over. You, you know, I have to say, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. That you bring that up because I mean again completely by accident not by not by design um, you know we we've had actually you, you're you're the third person that we've had on the show third you know um, who comes from kind of a biracial background um, mm. and then almost I I, I don't want to I can't speak for and, and that includes like Osama Cannon and Mustafa Davis I I can't speak to Mustafa Davis uh, because I, I don't remember his experiences along these lines, but I know, I remember Osama specifically talking about the fact that his father, African American, was the was the parent who had the most problem with his conversion to Islam and his older brother's conversion to the nation of Islam um, being the most resistant. So it's fascinating that you bring up the very sort of same set of experiences um, you know, uh, uh, given also your kind of biracial roots as well, which I didn't know before I had you on the show. So that, that 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 that's very fascinating, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's important to identify. Um, now, in, in, with regards to your own conversion and your own sort of trajectory into the or, uh, into the faith, um, is that by way of the Nation of Islam, or do you? No, no. Identify I, as I said, as I, I became the, my local mosque. Well, to even go further back, I rejected joining the Nation of Islam. My best friends uncle was a nation of islam i can remember sitting on his porch and hearing him that rap you know go on and on yeah um but i, I couldn't swallow it i just could not swallow white people being devils and black men being gods and that whole theology a, a spaceship in the sky you know oh man i, I couldn't couldn't buy it so um even though i visited the temple mm -hmm. At different times, I never could join it. It was interesting. And so my exposure um, when I really started looking for Islam was um, my local Sunni African-American mosque that actually grew, was a splinter from Imam Wali Akram, who started First Cleveland Mosque about 1936 in Cleveland. And um, he, so uh, African-American imam, um, you know, started the first mosque uh, in Cleveland, and almost all of the African-American mosques come out of that mosque in some mm. kind now, of it, way. Was there, like, did, is, that, is that an identifiable strand, you would say, within the African-American Muslim community? I mean, does that belong to any kind of, his, you know, historical movement? Well, you know, by the you know most of these mosques, Af what I call historically Sunni African American okay. mosques, start in the 30s and the 40s. By the 40s, soon after, really still during World War II, um, there is the the growth is sufficient enough that people started recognizing one another and recognizing the need for some type of unity. So actually, in the mid-40s, there was a movement to unify all of the Sunni African-American mosques. And e these mosques either grew out of the Moorish Science Temple, and so the, the philosophy of uh, Noble Drew Ali, Drew Ali, and they evolved into Sunni Islam, or they came out of the Ahmadiyya movement. And you can almost trace all the African-American mosques that were started before the 60s as either coming from these two uh, groups, Moorish Science Temple or... Um, but they embraced uh, 
you know, what they consider to be mainstream Islam as mm-hmm. opposed to kind of uh, offshoots or deviant groups that did not uh, practice Islam fully, like Morris Stein's Temple. That's right. So, and I think it's, you know, it's it's almost kind of kind of timely that you bring up the Ahmadiyya movement and its relationship with the African American community, because you know, for example, we just had, um, and I'm going to butcher the name, Zaki. Help me out here, Mahershala Ali. Yeah. Yeah, who who just won the Oscar uh, yeah. for best supporting actor, who you know identifies himself as part of that part of the Ahmadiyya movement. I think for a lot of maybe a lot of our listeners even. The idea that the Ahmadiyya movement had made great inroads with the African-American community sort of comes as a surprise, whereas this has been historically the case for, you know, 50 years yeah. now, over 50 years. Huh? No, no question. In the African-American community, yeah. the largest presence of Muslims were Ahmadiyya Muslims. So I grew up with a guy, you know, on a few streets away, he used to play with us in the playground. His name was Rashid, and he was Ahmadiyya. And of course, when I, you know, when I became Muslim, I, much later, I said, who is Rashid? You know, <laughs> this dude, yeah. you know, we had no idea. And I found out he was Ahmadiyya, you know, so uh, did you, the Ahmadiyyas did, were around. Yeah, and you did you say that they were the largest, you would say that they were, they were the largest in terms yeah. of percentage? Right. Right, right. Wow. Yep. Well, why do you? I mean, I, I, you know, I don't mean to you know, sort of put you on the spot here, but why, why do you think that's the case? Like, what was you? Do you think the kind of affinity or sense of, you know, what I mean? Well, they were um, missionaries. They were missionaries. Okay. They were very conscious, diligent missionaries. Mm. They went out and proselytized, they, and they were very open to African Americans. They welcomed the African Americans, and of, of course, you know th- they penetrated the jazz scene. So um, oh. people who had any inkling, any interest in jazz, knew Yusuf Latif, Rashan, uh, uh, Roland Kirk. Uh, they knew, you know, even McCoy Tyner. He became That's right. The, uh, so That's if right. you were in the jazz, you know. And, and, you know, eventually you ran across Ahmadiyya Muslim, you know. Um, so that, that and the fact that they were very outgoing uh, in, in their missionary work, um, you know, uh, attracted some African Americans. It's really not to the 60s when kind of the ideals of mainstream Islam and the mass conversions of African Americans in the '60s um, outstrip, you know, the, the Ahmadiyya Muslims and the Ahmadiyya African American Muslims. So that begins to wane uh, in terms of the influence, huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah d- no so, question. No right. Question. So now I, I know I know a part of your own sort of trajectory and, and growth and and as you as you as you characterize sort of maturation within the within your relationship to 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 Islam and relationship with the community, um, I, I think a, a, there, there's a chapter uh, of the sort of Dar es Salaam movement, um, and 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 that's not just unique to you. I mean, I mean you know when, when we had Professor Jackson on and he talks about his experiences, you know, in terms of the relationship with himself as a new member of the faith to the Muslim community that he came across in Philadelphia, uh, you know, by that time, the, the Dar es Salaam movement was very much, you know, um, in vogue there. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about the, the sort of Dar es Salaam movement and kind of, you know, where that, where that fits in to this, to these various, uh, to, to the overall picture that we've been kind of painting here? Well, to give you a sense, uh, the Dar es Salaam movement started in New York. Um, the, the big African American mosque was called the State Street Mosque. That's right. Um, where Sheikh Daoud was the leader, and he came out of uh, uh, the Moore Science Temple, embraced uh, you know mainstream Sunni Islam, but not terribly involved in the struggle. So he was of an earlier generation. You know, he, he um, starts uh, the State Street Mosque in the 30s, and uh, he's of an earlier generation. And when the people 
African Americans started converting uh, through music and through the black. So the early Dar es Salaam people were composed of musicians, former black Panthers, and former black nationalists. And Sheikh Daoud and his crew there just seem to be out of step with the new sensibilities of mm. uh, black people. And so they split and formed the nation, uh, the Dar es Salaam movement, and it took off. So um, I don't know how we in Cleveland found out about it, but we found out about it um, uh, and went to New York and sat down with them and decided to join the Dar es Salaam movement. But what the Dar did was combine against, again, this sense of struggle identifying very much with the black power movement um, and also at the same time embracing fully mainstream Sunni Islam as represented in Hadith and, and the text. So very much against any deviation from true Islam. And Would you... That was... Mm-hmm. Would it be safe to maybe almost characterize it as sort of like neo-Salafism or something within the black community? Yeah, yeah. no question. I mean, the idea was that we were going to follow carefully and thoroughly what we understood from Hadith and Quran. So, you know, we would read a Hadith about, you know, Prophet Muhammad said, so I'm sitting on the floor, and so we all ate on the floor. There you go. You know, yeah. um, you know, he didn't use a fork, we didn't use forks, you know. So right. we were, to yeah. a great extent, literalists at, at that early period, you know. Um, and because again, that just resonates with my time own... Time to mature. Yeah, I mean, because what you're what you're describing is almost to me verbatim, kind of the way we approached Islam. You know, given my own kind of you know uh, uh, relationship with the Salafi community. I mean, you know, and so yeah, that's exactly the case. That's right. Yeah, but it was not based on any type of uh, ideological approach. You that's know? right. We just wanted to be Muslim, and we thought that's what it meant. Got to it. be Muslim. Um, mm-hmm. By the time the Salafis come along as a an approach, you know, that huh? is being preached, our generation had already come uh, matured enough that we rejected that those type of attitudes. Right. Um, right. Now, and, when you, know, you talk about... Uh, thank God it, they did not exist when we were there, because we would have been flaming Salafis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> flaming Salafis. <laughs> That's a new one. Yeah, uh, hashtag a, flame, yeah, hashtag flaming been, Salafis, yeah. Yeah, we would have been terrible. <laughs> <laughs> now... Now you now you now you mentioned uh, Imam J- Imam J- J- Jamil Al Amin and uh, you know uh, his he has a relationship with the Dar es Salaam movement as well, correct? Right. Well, the Dar es Salaam movement um, started in uh, well, it actually started much earlier, sixty three, but really doesn't take off to about sixty eight when okay. the new leadership comes on. But then by seventy nine, they broke apart. Um, and what they broke apart because, you know, Sufism and mysticism was always a part of the Dar es Salaam movement. Um, you know, the idea of this, you know, mysticism, personal relationship to God was part of it. And so when a Pakistani sheikh hit New York, the the main leadership of the Dar decided to follow him. And so they created a new organization with him as the leader. And he became the leader. And so the Dar es Salaam movement ended. The remnants of the Dar es Salaam movement strategically decided not to keep the name 
because they did not want conflict with the old Dara members. So they created a new name and chose Imam Jamil as their leader, and this would be about 1971, and mm. they called themselves the National Ummah under Imam Jamil, and they have remained so. The National Ummah still exists. Their main activity is a riada, a sports festival. It's going to be held this year in Cleveland, and they have hundreds of people that attend. So they have remained a core. They have maintained a core of masajid that um, still belong to the organization. And the other organization now call themselves Muslims of America, and uh, they still exist also. Um, they haven't, neither one of the groups have grown much, mm. but um, that they, both of them still exist. Who, who was, I mean, what, was there, like, when, when you say the Pakistani sheikh in New York, uh, was that like, maybe like a Sufi sheikh? Uh, and that was the kind yes. of... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a kind of a modernistic su Sufi sheikh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But he is he, was is... introducing Sufism, but kind of his own brand. He he um, thought of himself you... as part of the Qadiriya. Okay. Uh, Do you recall Qadiriya? his name? Uh -huh. Yes, Jilani, Sheikh Jilani. Jeff Jelani, okay. Uh huh. I, I've, um, I've heard of him. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I mean, it's still it, around. It, I think he's still alive. And so, um, but he yeah. advised them to move out of the inner cities. And okay. so they started little colonies um, in rural areas. And so th there's, I don't know how many still exist. Um, but they had them all over the place um, in America at one time. The main ones uh, still exist in South Carolina, New York, um, places like that. Muslims mm. of America is, is the name of their group. Now, I think we'd be remiss not, not to kind of maybe provide a slight update to maybe some of our listeners, um, you know, who, who, who may not be familiar with Imam Jamil. Alumin's own struggle. Um, you know, I had the good fortune of visiting his community in Atlanta uh, in 1997, um, and 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 just for me, you know, one, one of my sort of one of the more poignant experiences in my life was hearing the adhan on the loudspeaker, and and that was for the first time in my life in, in the United States, that's to say, uh, and that was in Atlanta actually uh, when I visited Imam Jamil's community. Um, he's of course still uh, serving. Um, uh, 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 I think a life sentence. Um, but uh, any update on terms of? I know there's been a movement to try to get him released based on his medical condition. Um, are, are you are you at all aware of kind of the like what, what's been going on on yeah, that front? Well, I've been involved in you know his know. case from the very beginning, yes, sir. and uh, Alhamdulillah, we uh, through pressure organized by various Muslims, we got him out of the supermax prison that he was in, where they had this unbelievable regiment of 23-hour lockdown um, and no contact with humans. Uh, mm. It's just totally um, inhumane. So, um, alhamdulillah, he got out of that. He is now in population. Um, but his health is declining, and so the push is to get um, a uh, pardon for mm -hmm. him due to medical reasons. We, Many of us were hoping against hope that Obama might um, do that in the last days of his administration. Didn't happen, so it ain't going to happen now, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. In terms of like an executive pardon, but there's still other, you know, maybe still working with the state, perhaps. Or, but I guess it's a federal institution, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Um, it's a state charge. The state gave him up. Uh, Georgia, where he right. was convicted, um, had him for about a year, and they basically said he's too much trouble, and they gave him to the feds, and the feds have had him ever since. So one idea was to get him back into the state system. Yeah. 
Right. Um, I, I'm pretty sure jo- Georgia does not want him. And the reality is the federal system is better for prisoners than state systems. So in terms of many things, including medical care. So yeah. I, I don't think the family wants him back in the state system. Um, so, yeah, pardons can come from, uh, you know, various ways, but you, you would think that a high-profile person like Imam Jamil would have to get uh, high ups to sign off on, on a pardon. So um, that's why I said I, I don't think it'll come with this administration, uh, but maybe another administration, it, it might happen. Mm. Is there anything that the listeners can do, or or, or maybe to, to to support those efforts? I mean, I, you know, if you have that that information, oh, we'd love to make yeah, it accessible. Yeah, I, I would simply Google. I'm sorry, I, I if I'd have thought about it, I, I would have had. Oh no, that's okay. We can even put it after the show post. Yeah. 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 I mean, there are efforts. I remember, you know, signing the petition at one time asking for medical release. Um, and there is a group that that is, you know, fighting for his release. Um, okay. And uh, I'm, it's just not off, off the top of my head. I, I can't remember the exact name of the group. Um, Sorry. That's okay. Like I said, we can we can add the link after uh, after we post the show. So I do appreciate you at least uh, kind of providing um, a little bit of an update on that. Um, uh, if I could, uh, Doctor Bagby, I know we've taken a lot of your time, but I mean, I think again, we'd be remiss not to have you or, or to have you on the show and not to kind of have you talk about the uh, the the, the um, mosque. Uh, a project that you did with ISPU, the, like the uh, like the research that you did there. Um, if you could perhaps maybe kind of one talk about the the actual study, and then maybe we we can take a look at some, or we, we could analyze some of the findings that that you found to be very interesting and relevant. Mm-hmm. Well, professionally, as a professor, my research focuses on the American Muslim community, in particular, Masajid. Yes, and in the last few years, I have tried to switch gears from describing moss to be more prescriptive as to what moss should be doing and what they should look like. And I have worked with um, ISNA and ISPU on this issue of how to move Moss to the next level because uh, the common complaint is that our mosques are both not terribly welcoming, do not really um, have a place for women or young adults as much, uh, but especially women, and are not as active as many people would like for them to be in their communities. So that, you know, for me, this has, uh, you know, the idea of the active masjid is something that African Americans have always embraced. Um, And so it is part of my understanding of Islam. And as I've grown, I've also come to realize that the inclusiveness of Islam um, needs to be better reflected in mosques. So um, I am a a strong advocate um, through my research and just through my ability to pass on a message that um, mosques need to be more welcoming, more inclusive, and more active in, uh, in, in their involvement in society. So uh, God bless uh, ISPU when they reacted to the unmasked film documentary that was made, um, which basically showed this problem that is developing among uh, young adults, the second generation, 
immigrants of being alienated to a certain extent from mosque and um, basically they said let's try to understand what's going on and they brought me on board and so you know we did focus groups throughout America and that led to um, uh, kind of um, recommendations because that was uh, again the um, laudatory purpose of the study not just to describe but to make recommendations and so the research led to a document that is called creating the welcoming inclusive dynamic mosque and it's on ISPU website and um, and this is complementary to the ISNA effort uh, so even a, a year before um, ISNA uh, and their Masjid Development Committee, um, you know, developed a letter called um, uh, I forget the and, and it, a statement. That's it. The, the letter is called a statement on inclusion of women in mosque and basically it sets out the argument that mosque should be inclusive of women on all levels of their organizational structure and activities there should be uh, women should pray should have the option of praying in the same musalla with men just as the uh, Masjid of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was organized. And so really this is, uh, you know, a movement, if you will, maybe not yet, but this is a movement that wants relevancy. That was one of our key words in our ISPU study. Um, people want, they want to feel that their mosque is relevant, and that relevant means that they are engaged in what's going on in society, in their community. So, um, you know, I, I, I wish it were a movement, but I'm hoping that these efforts will actually lead to a movement to change our mosque, um, to be more prophetic. That's kind of one of the words we use. That. Mm -hmm. The prophetic mosque is inclusive and is dynamic, and we want mosques to, to live up to that. And that will better ensure the future of Islam uh, through the generations, we feel. Um, I, you know, I, I, to be honest, I, I, Dr. Bagby, I, I, I almost feel like, you know, um, there has been a movement that, that has been started. I think, you know, it, for example, in the past we've had, um, you know, Hind Mucky on the show, and and you know, she's got a she's got a website um, called the Side Entrance, which kind of tries to highlight, um, you know, especially I think some of the uh, prayer spaces for women um, at, at some of our mosques, and just kind of bringing that to to kind of the spot, you know, shining a spotlight as it were on 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 on, on those type of issues. Uh, we also have seen kind of the. Uh, the influx of sort of third spaces, which really, or, or, or creating safe spaces where uh, I think those who are, are marginalized in our communities or, or, or have been, um, and I think you, you, like you mentioned, women, youth, but also newcomers to the faith, for example, feeling that either the content or the space um, uh, of our mosques are not relevant to the kind of the needs of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the, you know, kind of changing demographics of the Muslim community. So, I mean, I think, you know, inshallah, I think, I think there is some work being done in that direction. So I think a lot of it can, you know, can, can trace its roots back to some of the findings of that, of that study. Well, I will not be hesitant in using the word movement from now on. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we need. Because unfortunately, yeah, yeah, I don't have a sense that our mosques are changing very quickly. So I think there is a lot of pressure that still needs to be put on mosque leaders to see some real change in, in our mosque. Um, I think it's beginning, but we have some ways to go. So ISPU and ISNA are 
sponsoring workshops to try to um, develop momentum and to identify champions who will take up the challenge of changing their individual mosque because that's where the action has to take place. I mean, it's a one mosque at a time type strategy, of, and you need people inside pressuring for change. And so our hope is that um, workshops and just spreading the word um, will have a buy-in for a critical mass of people to really change our mosque. And I think um, it it will, you know, foretell a a wonderful future for the Muslim community when we are united and um, active. I I think our future will be very good in in this country because ultimately that has always been the vision, by the way, of African-American Muslims, that we will change, we will help change American society, not that we will be Muslim and we'll go to heaven, even though that's the beginning of it, that is the foundation. We want to have a relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will end up with the blessings of, of paradise. But alongside of that is the command to be involved in society, to stand up for justice, uh, to command the good. So um, the vision of African-American Muslims has always been uh, of Islam as a social force, a political force in society. And that's what we're actually in this whole process with ISPU and ISNA, this is what we're aiming for. Um, the, 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 the key institution of our community, MOSS, um, becoming part of that force for change in America. Well, when, with that in mind, I mean, uh, as, as we wrap things up, are there any projects that you personally are working on that you'd like to give people a heads up on? Well, just these workshops, uh, we are just going to be publicizing them. Um, ISPU is working with uh, Muslim Legal Fund of America, MLFA. So they have joined forces with ISNA uh, to sponsor a series of workshops. And you can go on MLFA's website, I assume, and get uh, their workshops. And ISNA, along with ISPU, will be um, sponsoring or uh, announcing soon uh, their schedule of workshops. And if a community wants to invite us in to do a workshop on the welcoming mosque, um, they can always contact me um, at is, uh, issanbagby at gmail.com and we will work with the community to um, uh, organize a workshop in their local area. Well, terrific. Well, well, thank you so much for, for coming and hanging out with us for an hour. I know that uh, for our listeners and certainly for, for myself, it was ex- extremely uh, informative just getting your perspective on the social change of, of the past several decades. It was my pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bagby. I, I, I think you know uh, our listeners know. I mean, you know, one of the reasons we do this show is to is to kind of you know capture uh, the oral history of our community. And and I think that having a guest like yourself uh, with the kind of unique perspective that you bring um, has just really been an honor for the show. So thank you so much for taking the time out to do it. And uh, I'm so excited to hear about the kind of endeavors you're involved with right now. Um, because the idea of creating inclusive and, and relevant, uh, you know, community spaces is, 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 is something that I, you know, something very near and dear to my heart. So uh, thank you so much for doing that work. Good. May Allah bless your efforts. Thank you, thank so you sir. Um, and so, Zucky, why don't you uh, close this out? Tell us where people can find us. 
Well, you can send us an email at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. We'd love to hear from you. Also, if you are digging what we do, please go to iTunes and write a review or leave a star rating. Let people know what you think of the show because every little bit of positive feedback helps. And uh, with that, that wraps up this new episode of Diffuse Congruence, but we will be back in a few weeks with another new episode. Thank you for listening.